Today's presentation is by Colin Riddington. He is the owner of Mendip Data Systems, which is based in the UK. Colin distributes access applications to schools, businesses, developers, and individual users. And today's topic, he's going to talk about automatic form resizing in access. Share your screen and take it away, Colin. Welcome. Thank you very much, Maria. Right, let's see if we can just get this working. There we go. Hopefully you can now see a the first slide of a PowerPoint presentation. Can I just double check that everyone can see that okay? Yep, we're good. Excellent. Today's talk is about automatic form resizing and access, why you might find it useful, and hopefully encourage some of you to actually take it on board in your own applications. My name is Colin Riddington, and Maria's already mentioned I'm the owner of Mendip Data Systems, which is a company I set up when I retired from secondary school teaching some, oh, 10 years ago now. I'll give you a little bit more detail about myself before we get on to the main topic. I've been a long-term Access developer, well over 20 years now, but largely started with Access 97, though I did dabble with some earlier versions, though not seriously, until 97. I was, for most of my working life, a teacher in various secondary schools, and in latter years that included responsibility for whole school data analysis. And when I actually took on those sort of roles, I found there was nothing suitable that existed for my needs. So I started developing initially Excel applications, soon realized the the shortcomings of Excel for my purposes, then went on to Access, and once I actually took on Access, I really never looked back in terms of my enthusiasm for the program. Initially, it was just for my own use, but later on, I started developing databases for all the staff in my school, and then as these gradually became more and more popular in my school, we started selling to other schools across the UK as well. As mentioned, I'm the owner of Mendip Data Systems, there's my email, and it was originally created in order for me after retirement to carry on distributing commercial access applications for schools. For various reasons, one being the austerity regime that appeared just about when I, just before I retired, schools really didn't have enough money to actually carry on buying independent software from people like myself. So I started doing a broader focus to creating apps for businesses and individual developers. That's my website. Right, anyway, my website contains a large number of articles about different access topics, including automatic form resizing, example applications, sample code, and various security challenges, all of which are free. In addition, it still includes a number of commercial applications for the various different groups that I mentioned there. I'm a regular contributor at many access forums. My username at most of these is Isla Dogs. And in with regard to this own particular topic that I'm talking about now, then I've used automatic form resizing or AFR for well over 15 years in all my commercial databases and many example apps. So the purpose of this talk is to explain why you might find it useful and hopefully to encourage many of you to actually consider using it in your own applications. So why might you need to do so? Well, if like me, you've been developing for well over 20 years, you'll have been originally will have developed in much lower resolutions than we have today. And your applications will include text that is far too small to read at those higher resolutions. Alternatively, you might have the opposite problem, that you've been developing in a large screen, and then when you come to distribute your application, you find out that some of your users are working on much smaller monitors, including laptops, and even down to 10-inch tablets, possibly. That will require them to do a lot of horizontal and vertical scrolling, something they will get soon rapidly fed up with. Well, you might have tried alternatives. Access has built-in Alternative, which is to use form layouts, where you use grouping and anchoring. But if, like me, you find that they give often quite poor outcomes, you might want something better. Though, particularly though, your user base may have monitors which have got a wide variety of screen sizes, 10 inch up to 24 inch maybe, different form factors or screen shapes, widescreen, 4 by 4 to 3 and so on. And of course, widely different resolutions. 
your client base may well decide to change their monitors and they may have some of those with much larger monitors than others. And of course, therefore, you would want to try and make sure that your forms will remain usable as circumstances change in the foreseeable future. A further reason for using automatic form resizing is that some of your users may have vision issues and they may well need to enlarge their screens further than the typical user, and that's possible with AFR. Carrying on then, I went through a list of reasons why you might find automatic form resizing useful. Of course, not everyone's convinced that it's useful, and why wouldn't you find it useful? Well, you might be one of those very lucky developers who has a number of users, all of whom is, have exactly the same monitor size and resolution as you do, and as each other. Perfect. Why worry about actually doing anything else? But, are you sure that will stay the same forever? Are you sure that some of them won't increase or change their monitors, increase the size, change the resolution in the future? Are you absolutely certain? If you are absolutely certain about that as well, then you might as well switch off from this talk now. But, let's assuming that you are interested enough to carry on, then, OK, let's just show you what can happen if you try one of the alternatives. Now, I know some of you do use form grouping and anchoring, and you probably say, it works fine for me. Well, here's an example form, which has got on the left a number of text boxes, a combo, there's an option group there, there's a tab control, and there's a subform, and there's some text at the bottom there. OK, let's just now show you what happened when I maximised that form. And as you can see, it looks an absolute mess. The items on the left have moved to the middle. OK, the text has moved upwards, the subform has stretched across, and so on. Those of you that use it regularly will probably know what I've done there, and I know, and you know, that I could do it better than that. But I still find it very, very limiting in terms of what you can achieve. So, let's take the same form. So, now then, it's exactly the same form as before, but I've removed the layout guides and I've added automatic form resizing. When I show you the form view, you can now see that everything has increased in size proportionately and that it's also been repositioned correctly as well. Hopefully that's clear from that screen there. I'll go to the next screen. So what actually happened just then on that previous slide? Well, first of all, the forms are automatically resized to match whatever screen size the user has and whatever resolution that they have. All the form objects are repositioned proportionally in the right place on the screen compared to all the other objects. And also all of those form objects and the contents, including the fonts that are used, are also resized proportionally as well. If the user changes the resolution, or if they change the scaling from the standard 100% to 125 or whatever, then it will update automatically. At the very worst, they'll need to close that form and reopen it. It will also update automatically if they move to a different monitor, different size or different resolutions such as my secondary monitor. It doesn't matter whether you use overlapping windows that I still prefer or tab documents, it works in both. For tab documents they're already maximized of course but it will enlarge those objects as well and the fonts on those. It works equally well with pop-up forms, with the lovely split forms, lovely being a sarcastic comment there, and if, like me, you like hiding the application interface, all of those work fine. There is an optional form zoom feature, just like you get in Word or Excel, but not in Access, which will allow the users who want to enlarge their screen to be able to do so. You'll be glad to know the code is actually already set up to run in both 32-bit and 64-bit. You don't need to do anything at all. And best of all, although the code behind this is complicated for the developer, it just needs one line of code in the form load event. And that is that. You just tell it to resize the current form, resize form me. And you don't need to worry about the code. That is all that you actually need to do. So, 
go to form view this one here is one which is used to find out the location of photographs that are taken on mobile phones or wherever you've got the GPS data within the image there. Go to form view and again you can see that I've got a photo on the left there. I've got a map here, take from Google Maps which is loaded automatically. It gets the EXIF information including the longitude, latitude and so on and it can even work out exactly where you were and which direction you were facing when you took the photograph. But that's irrelevant to this other than to say it's all enlarged perfectly despite the fact you've got some complicated controls including a slider control and so on there. Let's try another one. This time a slightly simpler form here. Currency exchange rate tracker, form view, everything's enlarged, everything's in proportion. Hopefully you can see that okay. And the next form here is one that you're, you're going to see in the example app when I get onto that in just a minute or so. And this has a variety of different controls, which is useful for showing you how it can handle labels, text boxes, buttons, combo boxes, list boxes, check boxes, toggle buttons, rectangles, option groups, tab controls, images, hyperlinks, lines, subforms, and charts. Just about every type of control that you will get in a standard access form. All of those can be handled perfectly. I've already mentioned Zoom as well, and just to give you a simple example, which I'll show you properly later. Here's a Zoom form, which is at its standard size of 100%. Users, in, in reality, of course, I've shrunk this slightly to fit this onto the screen here. Users may or may not find that comfortable. They might find it too big. You never know. They might want to shrink it. Or more likely, they'll want to enlarge it. And in this particular form, I've given a range of 75% to 125, which I can select using a combo or with the slider control there. Split forms, I mentioned. Split forms, I find as a developer, very difficult to work with. They are very limited in how much you can change them in terms of the number of things that you can do to them. Uh, before they start to actually misbehave. I've actually got my own emulated split form to replace this, but here's a standard split form. The only thing that's different about this is I've removed the splitter bar, because that actually caused problems with automatic form resizing. The split form itself works perfectly, and you can see here the single form portion at the top there. That dotted line indicates for the code where to put the data sheet section below there. And I'll come back to that later on. And one last screen before we actually start looking at the application itself then. I think this is the last screen here. OK. Another form, lots of buttons and some writing on the side there. And here it is in form view, application interface hidden and with the desktop showing in the background there. OK. This is the last screen before we move on to the application itself. Typical automatic form resizing code. That's from one of the forms I've just shown you. Form load event, one line. That's it. It resizes. In this particular case, I've maximized the form, but obviously that's a separate thing here. If I've got subforms, there's a slightly more complicated set of code there. If you are including a subform within a main form, you may not to re need to resize it separately. It will just be enlarged along with the rest of the, the form controls. But you might want to look at that subform on its own or as a standalone form. So, in which case, you might want to resize it. So, the form load event then checks whether it's a subform or not. If it's not a subform, if it's a standalone form, it's resized. Don't worry about that line, that's not relevant here. The code to do that, some of you will have seen this sort of code before now, it checks whether it's got a parent or not. If it has a parent, then it is a subform. If it hasn't got a parent, it's not a subform. I hope I said that the right way around. When you close a subform there, it's best to unresize the form, bring it back to its normal size there. I'm going to now move my PowerPoint to one side and check that you can see my access application with one of the forms I showed you before. I will minimize the navigation pane there 
This is a form with grouping and anchoring. Just to show you here, the controls on the left are grouped and I've used anchoring with these, as you will see here. Form view, but it's just restored. You may say, well, what's wrong with that? Absolutely nothing. As it says here, it works absolutely fine when the form is restored, but not when it's maximized. Does anyone know from just looking at that why that has messed up so badly? It's, obvious, it's obviously rubbish. When you're doing anchoring, you've got different possibilities. And in this, I've stretched across the bottom there. Okay, with these ones here, stretch down and right. I, I've deliberately exaggerated the problems here by choosing inappropriate grouping and so on. But as I say, with anything other than the simplest forms, I find it almost impossible to get right. Others will disagree with me, I know. Let's close that form. And let's open exactly the same form, except this time with no grouping. But I've added a resizing code. And when I do that, as I showed you earlier, it works perfectly. OK, I'm going to now move to the main form which I'm going to use for the next few minutes. And it's one I showed you earlier. And you should now see a complicated form with lots of different control types. As I mentioned earlier, I've used this. It's from a different example application. Originally, the purpose of this was to actually show how you could hide a group of controls by using the tag property or lock a group of controls or disable a group of controls. But each of these controls on this form are tagged either A, B, C or D. Those that are tagged D will always be visible, enabled and unlocked. That allows me to use the form. But those that are A, B or C, I can actually hide or disable as appropriate. For example there, and you can see what the controls are in brackets there next to each one here. What the tag is, I'm sorry. So to disable A, hide B and lock C, I click this button here. That will hide those two items, the combo. It will hide that bound frame there, but not the toggle buttons. It will hide the tab control. It will hide the subform. Oops. Sorry, it's disabling them. I didn't read what I actually wrote there. Let's just go back to that again. OK, this time I'll hide A, right, disable C, lock B. Different one here. You can see I've got rid of some of those and I've locked other ones here. OK, anyway, that's from a separate application. My screen resolution, my default screen resolution is 1680 by 1050 and it's a widescreen monitor. So ratio of the horizontal to the vertical is 1.6 in this particular case. If I go to design view, you will see that that form is actually significantly smaller. It's about 20 centimeters wide and about 13 or so 14 centimeters high. Now, the reason why it's so small and the text is obviously illegible at the moment to all of you, that is because I've been using automatic form resizing for so long that when I started using it, I was still using a base resolution or a standard resolution of 800 by 600. And I've continued to use that size to this day. So therefore, if I actually had that form on a resolution of 800 by 600, it should roughly fill the form. Let me just show you that. I'll go to settings, go to display. Sorry, I moved it off that before with the sound problems here. Moment, eight, 1680 by 1050. Take it all the way down to that. Move that off the screen. And now I'll go back to form view. And OK, I've got some fairly large items at the sides here, which are much too big for me now on this screen. That's the form pretty well, not perfectly, fitted at 800 by 600, as I hope you can see. I'm going to go back to design view. I'm going to change the resolution. 
to 1024 by 7. Remove that. Go to here. And it almost perfectly fits the screen. Can you see that now at 1024 by 768? Yes. Thank you. I'll change it once more. And when I drag that out of the way, because I didn't change the design view, it's not absolutely perfect at the moment. I could do that by changing the design view, or I could close it and reopen it. I'm just going to go to design view this time. And then I'm going to reopen it. And now it fits pretty well. This time it's a widescreen resolution. And because it's a different form factor in terms of the resolution, in order to avoid stretching things horizontally, I've taken the option here, or the, the decision many years ago, to actually leave, if necessary, some blank space at the right there. It's not a resolution that many of my users will use anymore, though, so it's not something I need to worry about here. If I just now go back to my standard resolution, Again, it's not the right size at the moment here. If I now just go to a different form and go back to it, okay, you can see it now fits perfectly. Now, some users may have the same resolution as you, the same size screen as you, but they may prefer to change the scaling. That's too big. But again, remember, I didn't change the to design view or close and reopen the form. So if we now do so, and you can see it fits perfectly, you wouldn't know that the scaling had happened. So it doesn't matter what the resolution is or what the scaling is, it works. The one thing to notice though is it's wrongly reporting the screen resolution here. It's done this now, I'm on 125%, and what it's actually done, and it's, uh, what is it, 1650, 1680 by 1050. I'm on 125%, so what it's done is it's reduced those by four-fifths to make it work. So four-fifths of 1050 is 840, and so on. It basically works no matter how the user sets up their screen. I'm not going to change the resolution or the scaling anymore once I've changed it back to 100%. should stop. I'm just going to go to a different form. It looks the same, different color. And back here again, just check, is there anything anyone wants to ask me before I move to the next screen? I have a question, Colin. Yep. I also wrote a resizing program. I have an issue with the option frames. Did you have any problem with those? Yep, I'm going to mention that later, Crystal. So if you, if you bear with me, I'll put it off till then. Both tab controls and option groups cause problems. There is an issue with that. Uh, which I'll explain later on, okay? Remind me if necessary, but it's actually one of the items I'm planning to do. I'm also curious about continuous forms. That isn't an issue, basically. This is a continuous subform here, all right? It works, but I'll come back to that later, Ben. Right, form two. I showed you the resizing in action there, but just to give you an idea, this is a form identical in all ways for the previous one, except for the background colour and the fact that when it's loaded, the resizing has been removed. To get it to resize, I'll just click this button here. You notice I've made that button text a little bit larger so I can read it. At the moment, resize, instantaneous. And it's also resized that button caption there to be the same as all the others there. So identical. Form 3. Again, same thing, different colour. The only difference this time is I've got the zoom control built in. And here it's at standard size here, 100%. My user might want to enlarge that slightly. And it's getting close to the edge now because it's not one that actually is purpose built for this process. It's a bit too complicated. Things are too close to the bottom here. I can increase that up to 125 and I'm definitely going to be losing some things and I'll need to do a bit of scrolling down in order to get them back. And the scroll bars appear automatically. Let's take it the other extreme. Doubt anyone's going to be comfortable using that, but you never know. You can also, if you prefer, use the slider control. 
that is an active X control. It's not required. You can just do it with a combo here. Let's go back to 100%. And sometimes with this form, I have some problems here. I will just change that back there. Let's look at the simpler pop-up form, which also has zoom. And again, I showed you this earlier. I've used the same range, 75 to 125. You can choose whatever you like for this. You can change it down to 50 to up to 150 you want, but it's unlikely that many users would want to go beyond about this sort of distance here. And again, with a larger form here, all right, with a larger zoom, I've got scroll bars appearing automatically. If your users log in in some way or other, then the username can actually be used to actually then save their preferred Zoom value. So if a particular user has the option of actually using Zoom on one or many of your forms, then if they save that, it will save that 125% value for all other forms with Zoom. So they don't have to keep redoing it. Of course, they can still go back and change their mind later if they wanted to do so. And the reason for that was I'd actually not change the zoom back. I need to do that or I'm going to mess up all of my other forms. I've now resaved it at 100%. So when I close that, it's restored this to the size it was meant to be. You may have noticed it was briefly too large. Okay, I'm going to close that. And I've got a few other forms on here to show you. I mentioned the split form. I personally do not like split forms. I like what they look like. I just don't like working with them. Normally you would have a splitter bar on view here and I can't actually remember which tab that's in. Splitter bar. Anyone able to tell me quicker than I can get there? I'd be grateful. It's all right. I just couldn't find where the splitter bar property was. It's actually in the format tab there. I've got it switched off. I could switch it on again. But the reason why I don't use that is because it caused problems with automatic form resizing. And it's not needed to actually make the split form work properly. The dotted line there is used for two purposes. One, to actually help if things go wrong in terms of sizing. Not likely, but it's possible. And I'm going to make it happen in a second with a bit of luck. And two, it tells me where the data sheet portion is going to be. OK, now, if I now close that here, and if it gives me the option of saving it, right, I'm going to say no, first of all. Close that again. It's automatically designed to go back to that. When I reopen it, no problem. This time, I'm going to close it. And, <laughs> sorry. Design view. Your users won't do this, of course. Now, hopefully, I will have triggered the save thing this time. Still didn't. What I was trying to show you was that the form could get oversized when I do that. It could get over enlarged, and I would like to try and do that if I can. Just say something slightly. That might be enough to do it. And you'll notice there that the top part, the single form, the header, and so on, is now oversized. Notice the data sheet is still the same size as before. Data sheets are not affected by automatic form resizing. There's nothing I can do to make that actually work. For that reason, I use continuous forms rather than those. But obviously, as a developer, that's irritating. As an end user, that would be end of show they would not be happy about that it will only happen where you're changing from design view to form view and back again repeatedly but you need to be able to deal with that if it happens for you as a developer so i've built in a form called form unresizer the form that caused me problems was the split form i've got two options shrink it which is what i need to do in this case or enlarge it if for some reason I've managed to go the other way, made it too small. Shrink the form. It opens the form in design view. You see it's brought it back in terms of the size it should be, but it's far too wide here. 
That line has a useful purpose. It tells me how wide the form needs to be. That there also tells me how wide, sorry, how high the header needs to be. That's pretty well OK. Save that and reopen it. And it's fine again. There's a couple more things I want to show you before I show you any of the code here. To help people who actually want to do so, there. Oh, sorry, just mentioned this here. The subform then, that subform here, I'm also using that subform as a standalone form if I want to. And you can see it's been resized with the code that I mentioned before I started showing you the application. Last thing on this before I show you some code, I've made three template forms. The templates here are designed such that if the screen was 800 by 600, that there would fill the screen perfectly. When I run automatic form resizing, it spreads across to fit the screen as you wish to do. So it was on an 800 by 600 base resolution, form width, the form height in design view, and so on. The font size there, I've got a form here just to compare font sizes there. Okay, the header is just a bit bigger than 22 point in this resolution here. The text here is somewhere between 11 and 12 point there, which is fine as far as I'm concerned. As I said, it will maximize here and it will work in other resolutions as well. But the important thing at this point here is one thing you need to do in the code. As I've said al already, the code is complicated, but you don't need to worry about most of that. But that's not why you're here. So let me just now go to the VB editor, go to mod resize form, and if I scroll all the way up here, let me just say before we go any further that although much of this code here has been updated over the years by myself and others. It's not my code originally. Back in 2003, somebody called Jamie Suzernik, I probably pronounced his name wrongly, released this code as freeware. You can find other similar code in various commercial applications, for example, Peter's software shrink stretcher, but I don't see any point in using that. This works just as well. Over the years then, okay, this has been adapted by various people. Uh, somebody here whose name I'm not going to try and pronounce, Nathan Carroll, a colleague of mine who actually first introduced me to this many years ago, Jeff Blumpson, and a name here that might be familiar to some of you, Mike Myers. Can anyone think of who Mike Myers might be? Strange actor. I didn't hear that, but Austin Powers is the name I was going to say there. It's certainly not Austin Powers, let me just assure you that. Anyway, Many modifications by myself as well, including support for wide screens, updating the APIs and the code for 64 bits, dealing with tab documents, zoom forms, dealing with issues with oversized forms. The next bit here is purely what Jamie did. There are several constants at the beginning. These three were the ones that were most important. In fact, this one is the absolute most important of the lot. The horizontal resolution of the form in design view, the base resolution that you created that form in so that it would fill the screen completely at that resolution. I use 800 by 600. I still do because I'm used to it now. But if I was using a different resolution as my base resolution, I would change that value. But it's 800 for me when I'm using this form here. So to use this form as a template, you set that value to 800 if it isn't already at that. Let me close that form and let's show you a different one. Now this one here is based on a base resolution of 1024 by 768. So it's at a higher resolution as a starting point. It's a bigger form, slightly bigger text, so it's still too small to read here. When I increase this, it actually fits pretty well. It's just slightly off screen to the right. And also, I've lost some text at the bottom there, as you will see in just a second. 
and the reason it's wrong is I need to change that horizontal resolution in here. In this particular case, it's 1024 by 768. So if I change that, save it, drag it out the way, design view, and back to form view, it's fitted. Roughly 22 point, which is what I like. Roughly 11 to 12 point in this resolution here. And that comment there, as you can see here. I think there'll be some of you who say that's still too small for me to work with in design view. So I've done one more. I'll just close that one. I've never used this in reality. And I've deliberately not changed the resolution, sorry, the constant value in the VBE before I opened it here. Design view. I'm losing stuff to the left and indeed to the right. So I need to change that to 1366 in the VBE. So question, Colin, I noticed you're changing the horizontal, but you're not changing the vertical. That's not necessary. No, nope, that's coming up next. Let me just finish this screen and I'll, sh I'll show you. And you may say it's still not quite big enough. I actually designed this so it would work on my secondary monitor, which is 1920 by 1080. But you'll get the idea there, I hope. And I think that was Maria there who said, why am I not changing the, the horizontal, sorry, the vertical resolution? When this code was written, you needed to change both horizontal and vertical. In those days, all screens were four by three. The horizontal resolution was four times, four thirds of the vertical. So therefore you wanted to change it in both directions equally. Then they brought out screens that were 5.4 resolution, then 16 by 9, 16 by 10 and so on. And the problem there is if you increase both of those, then you will end up with things being overstretched in one direction or could be done like that. So I made a decision some years ago the vertical resolution would be taken out of the code. It's not used anywhere. If I did that, all right, as it says below there, you can change it just for your memory, if you like, knowing what you've done, but you don't need to. It's not used. It can be ignored. You don't need to do it. If I didn't do that, then screens that were right vertically so they fitted would be overstretched horizontally. You don't want that. So I'm going to go back to 800 before I forget that. And I'll just mention this third constant here. I've never changed it. The number of dots per inch, 96. You can change it if you wanted to, to 120 or whatever. It's unlikely you will need to. If in doubt, leave it alone. Similarly, I have never, ever changed any of those constants. In fact, I don't know what all of them particularly do, and I'm not going to dwell on it now. There isn't time, and I'm not going to go through all of this code. It's complicated. There's various types that are defined there. API is defined for 64-bit as well as 32. You get the screen resolution. You get the screen shape called form factor. You can, if you want to, get the horizontal and vertical resolution separately, though they're no longer used. But I've got that in there. You get the screen shape. This one's very important. This here is the multiplying factor. Get factor is a single variable here, single factor here, and this will tell you what you're multiplying your screen up by. And if I just turn the debug on for a second here, and you can see it's already come up here elsewhere. Okay, the single factor at the moment is one, the multiplier is 1.75. Okay, it's what is multiplying up the original screen by, and telling me that it's a widescreen monitor. This is the main resize code. I'll just bring that down again. Again, I'm not going to attempt to explain it now. It's too complicated to do in this time here, and I doubt people will take it in. You can read it yourself when you look at the example app if you're interested here. But basically, it gets the resolution, it gets the multiplying factor, it decides whether or not the screen is a higher resolution and size than it was designed in, multiplies up accordingly if necessary. It then, if we get down to here, right, it makes a modification for tab documents. I found that tab documents didn't line up perfectly with automatic form resizing, but a simple 
fix was just to briefly maximize the map navigation pane and minimize it again, and it works. This is the code I use to fix problems if it gets too large, together with that. And part of the resize for me code was this particular sub here. Resize the form sections and the controls in them by the multiplying factor and do it on the form that's specified. So, what does it do? First of all, it resizes the height of each section. The header, the detail and the footer. It then resizes and relocates each control. For each control it loops through, unless it's a page break, which you obviously can't do anything with at all in terms of resizing, it will then change the height of the control, its left position, its top position, and its width. And it will multiply each of the original values by that multiplying factor. Next, it needs to actually deal with the contents of those controls. And this is where Mr. Not Austin Powers came in, Mike Myers. And then each of these different controls, as necessary, is modified further. Anything which has got text in it, you need to increase the font size by that factor there. Originally, Mike had that separated out there, and it caused problems with certain controls. So I put it back into this, this select case code here. List boxes, as above, font size, but also increase the column widths by that multiplying factor. Combos, same again, increase the column widths, but also increase the list width by that multiplying factor. And lastly, tab controls, which can be problematic, increase the font size and the tab fixed width, if you have a fixed width and the fixed height. Any other control, you don't need to do anything because they don't have contents which are affected by this, such as rectangles, page breaks, subforms, and so on here. Subforms, if necessary, you deal with separately. And there's various other bits of code here and so on. But, as I say, I don't wish to go through that in detail. The sub um, here about the Zoom form, I'm going to just mention that in a second when I go back to the PowerPoint, which I'm about to do unless anyone wants to try and interrupt me. I'll just pause for a second. Hey, Colin. How did you resolve the issues with option groups? Yep. The, basically, that's coming up on the PowerPoint. It's the position where you place the option group in the tab, the tab form on the screen here. If I, It's not done in the code here. If I just go to this, close that one, and go back to here, The, the the main thing to do is to avoid having your anything with a frame, which is the option group and the tab control, those should not be at the bottom right of your form, if possible not at the bottom of your form either. If you do have them too close to the bottom, the whole form can come over enlarged. Was that what you found out when you were trying something similar yourself? I don't remember exactly, but I remember we just eliminated all the option groups. I could not get it to work. I got the subforms, the tab control, everything else was just fine, but I could never get the option groups to work right, so we took them out. Never do something like this live, but if I bring that right down to the bottom and take it to the right, okay? Now, I'm going to mess up my form probably now. Where is it? It's somewhere over there, but I can't see it. And typical that I can't mess it up this time. But basically, if I do have it too close to the bottom, I can cause the frame to become too big. The frame seems to act on its own. It sort of happened there. You can see it's partly off screen there. Basically, it's a, a, an avoidance thing. You learn that if you use option groups or if you use tab controls, not to put them at the... Sorry about the noise there. Not to put them at the bottom there. If... Well, I think that I ran into an issue also that the contents weren't lining up right with the frame. Right. As you... And this was also quite a long time ago. I don't know. I mean, 
back when I first found this code, back in 2005 or so, Jamie Cernick, in his own help file, said tab controls and option groups can cause problems. Uh, and he never managed to solve it, nor does anybody else. So it's, you know, I'd love to say I know how to fix it. I have, I have to say I just make sure it doesn't happen. Okay, I mentioned Zoom form code. I'm just going to quickly mention this further. When a Zoom form is loaded, you resize it. You do that because you may or may not want to resize it further afterwards. The next section there is nothing to do with automatic form resizing here. The next thing here is to check whether the user has got a default Zoom size saved, in which case you use it and you scale up proportionately. And if that default for that user is more than or rather other than 100%, smaller or usually larger, then you scale up. And once you've done that, you then save the value for future use. But this was the important part in the update form zoom. I did allude to that when I was showing you the mod resize form code here. So let's see what that does there. First of all, you turn off screen, re screen updating. You then, rather counterintuitively, you unresize it again. You bring it back to what it was beforehand. You don't want to keep resizing on top of resizing. You center the form if it's a pop-up, particularly so that it will actually then scale up later as you want it to be in the middle. Okay, the next thing is you multiply up the form according to the zoom factor. You reset each section and you do that with some hidden lines that are on there that actually will tell you what the width should be, okay? The height should be and so on. And then if it's above 100% you turn on the scroll bars in both directions, that's setting 3, otherwise you turn them off. And you've done all that, it takes a split second, you turn screen updating back on again and you store the zoom value. A bit complicated to take in there, let's just talk about how to get the best results and I've said some of this already. First of all, people who find this code either from a, a post I've done on various forums or on my website will usually want to use it because something's gone badly wrong. That's not likely to give you the best results. The best way to actually use it is to plan it in from the beginning. Don't try and add it to an established application where the sizing has gone wrong. Always scale up. Although, as you can see with the zoom form bit, you can scale down. It's designed for scaling up from a lower resolution. Always develop in the lowest or the base resolution that any of your users would have. Or lower than, it doesn't matter, but not higher than that. Otherwise they would be scaling down. Use an appropriate template in the, size, in the sense of the right size for that base resolution. And make sure that constant value matches that. I suggest maximized forms are better but they do work with forms being resized. Take care with pop-up forms, otherwise they can disappear off the top of the screen as they can without automatic form resizing and below the bottom. You want to avoid that. You can't use data sheets. Continuous forms work fine. I think it was Ben earlier asked how I deal with that. I don't really need to. They work. Right? That's, that's it really. As a precaution, I'd recommend that you leave some blank space at the bottom and the right of the form, particularly if you're using Zoom, but it's not a bad idea anyway. And, as mentioned, keep your tab controls and option groups as near the top and as near the left of your form as you can to avoid any oversize issues. They might happen during development. They won't happen to your users. They're not going to design view and back. So... I got asked this question recently, and when I was first asked, I didn't know the answer. Somebody said, I've got a huge monitor. I'm really proud of it. It's 4K, and it's 34 inches. Mine are nothing like that. Mine are about 22 inches or so. As you probably know, the maximum form width and axis is 22.75 inches, or the metric equivalent there. Question. And as I said, I didn't know until I tried it. Can you actually use automatic form resizing to exceed that. Anyone know the answer to that? 
It would be a no. Correct. Next question. Why not? No, because none of this code and none of what you've done has changed the basic fundamental set of options and limits that Access supports. Correct. Well done. Form dimensions are in TWIPS. 1440 TWIPS to an inch. Microsoft, in their infinite wisdom back in 1992, decided to use an integer data type. You can probably see what the problem is. 22.75 times the number of pixels in an inch is 32,760, which is as near as makes no odds the integer limit. You cannot go past that. So if you use automatic form resizing and it wants to go above 22.75 inches, it can't. Similarly with section heights and so on. What a shame. But say Microsoft had future-proofed and they'd use a long number data type instead. Well, how big could forms be? Theoretically, the long integer, sorry, the long number data type has a very large maximum limit there, 2 billion plus. Divide that by 1440, you've got almost 1.5 million inches, or 3.78 million centimetres. Now, so that's I'm, a bit big. I'm going to interrupt you, Colin. Yep. The question is whether or not we can use this with the executable format, ACCDEs, etc., or whether it has to be design and save issues. No, you can use it with ACDE and with MDE. You can use it with executables, AC, you know, ACCDB or ACCDE. I can't even say it. And it works in runtime as well. Not a problem. This is my last slide. If you want to read about this at your own speed, that is the web page. It's a three-part article. The first page goes through why you might find it useful, and it has an earlier version of this application, which you can actually get from the website. If you want my current version, email me, and you can have that one there. The second page then goes through the Zoom feature, and it also covers some potential issues such as the tab control and option group and the third part goes through how the code works. I'll stop. Questions? Anyone you can unmute yourself or type a question in the chat? Crystal asks that she thought that you showed us a form used as a subform also resized. Perhaps she mistook that that meant it was being saved. What I was saying there was that if you have subforms that are sometimes used as standalone forms, then you would want to treat them differently when they're within a parent form and when they're actually a standalone. Within the parent form, it may well be that the subform will actually enlarge as you want when the main form is resized. But if you're using it as a standalone form, then you will add the resizing there. It, it basically is seamless. It determines whether it's got a parent form or not. So I'm not changing it at all. I'm just basically adapting it according to the circumstances. Colin? Yes. Hi, Adrian. I think. Hi. Yes, you're quite right. I was I was uh, having trouble earlier because I had the wrong microphone set, which wasn't actually working, wasn't plugged into this application. So I was shouting at, well, not shouting, but calling for your attention and no one responded, bizarrely. Anyway, earlier you were talking about, you were showing that where it prompted you to save all the time when you closed the form. And I got the impression I was, um, I still have problems with my WebEx. So Crystal very kindly showed me what you were doing through a Skype sharing screen, but it was it was great. I was able to follow, but it was a bit smaller, and and also I was struggling to follow a little bit. But I got the impression that the the fact that the user could save it when it when it you, when you made changes could be something that caused problems further down the line. Um, and I just wanted to mention that. There is a way of avoiding that. I've got a, an article on that, which 
ensures that when you make changes to a to a form like that because essentially this code will make design changes but it's not design changes that you want saved so would i be right in thinking that that might be helpful in what you're doing i'd be very happy if you can actually pass on a link to that but in fact, I deliberately put it so that I was saving that there because I wanted to show you how it could go wrong about in terms of oversizing it. Of course. The user would not be changing anything at all. They wouldn't have the opportunity to change the design and therefore the, the save issue wouldn't have occurred with them. So in reality, in 15 plus years, uh, it never happens. But to be honest, I don't, in my own apps... On the rare occasions I use a split form, I use my emulated split form, which doesn't have this problem anyway. Um, it's, I, I'm curious, because I would have thought that when you make changes to, like when you change the font size and everything, that would then cause the, the form design to be changed and it would prompt the user to save that, wouldn't it? No, it doesn't. I mean, you, you're resizing it for display purposes. As soon as you actually close the form, it's back where it was before. So it it doesn't know it's not a problem. That's weird. Oh, I'm very confused. But never nevertheless, I will dig that out, and uh, if I can do it before we close, I'll dig it out and get it into the chat for you. Yep, that's great. But I mean, do download the example app from my website, Adrian, and you'll be able to see that for yourself. It doesn't cause problems. At least it wouldn't cause problems for your end users. Any problems about resizing? would only be for somebody who is actually, while in development, going backwards and forwards between form view and design view. Uh, but for me, have, I've used it so many years now, I practically never have a problem anyway, but I know how to fix it when it does happen. Oh, okay. We, Colin, we have another question from Peter asking, does it work with navigation controls? <laughs> navigation forms, you mean? I never use navigation forms. I did, if I remember right, I did a couple of months ago try one and it worked fine. Uh, but I don't like them personally and I don't use them. I create my own forms that will actually have all the navigation that I want to. And again, are much more customizable. But as, as far as I know, the only form that causes any problems at all is a split form. And I've dealt with that by removing the splitter bar. So yes, if you love navigation forms, it shouldn't be an issue. Navigation controls. What do you mean by navigation controls, Peter? Is Peter still there? Uh, sorry, I don't know what he means by navigation controls. I assume he means navigation forms. He, he is, but he's muted. Oh, there well, he goes. Ah, right. <laughs> yeah. Yes, it's the, uh, the navigation control. It's, it's like your tab form but uses subforms for the different forms it loads. I call that a navigation form. I think we're talking about the same thing. Yeah, it's exactly. one of the, the special built-in forms that comes with access. Yes? It's one of the controls. Yeah. Yes. But as I say, well, I, I, navigation controls, I, I think of as being the, the buttons that will move you from one record to the next in a single form. Uh, no, no, no. It's it's. Yeah, I I don't think it would have a problem with those, Peter. Uh, actually, the... I mean the the thing with the navigation control, I like the tab control better because in the navigation control, the only thing that you can address is what's active, and you can't look at any of the values on other tabs. So I don't use it either, but. I I, th I don't think this would have an issue with the uh, navigation control resizing. I'm almost I'm almost certain in my original planning that I tested it. Um, I will check again just in case. But as I say, I don't believe there was a problem. I thought there might have been, but there, I'm sure there wasn't. You're likely to have problems with subforms because with the navigation control, every one is a subform for of the navigation form. Therefore, um, it's always going to have a parent. I'll I will test it again with sub. I'm, I think I did so, but I would be very pleased to hear your feedback if you try it. But I will oh. try it for myself. Okay. 
I don't, as I said, I don't personally like navigation forms. I prefer doing things where I've got full control, which is why I don't use them. I create my own and why I don't use the standard built in split form. I create my own. So thank you, Colin, very much. Um, in the interest of time here, we're going to go ahead and close today's meeting. Um, but I really appreciate you sharing this with us. Um, I put up here to share some of the next events that we are hosting in October, November, and December. Um, the October session I am doing, and then in November, we're having uh, a guest speaker. Um, I can open this. Uh, Peter Cole talking about um, API calls and 64 bit. And then Crystal and I will finish up the um, do the conclusion to the general tips and tricks series for the beginning developer. So thank you all for joining us and thank you so much, Colin, for your interesting presentation today and everyone for, you know, bearing with us with the delay. Um, I, the sound actually turned out okay, uh, Colin. And there were a few times, but it was pretty good. Uh, mostly the delay affected us, but I think we figured it out. So. Thank you so much. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you for having me here. I'm sorry my internet was so problematic earlier on particularly, but I believe that I've recorded all the sound in case Crystal, when she comes to actually edit the video, has major problems. I'm sure we can work it out anyway, even if I have to dub it. <laughs> all right. Thank, Thank you, you all. Excellent. Have... Excellent. Cheers. Thank you. Have a great evening. Thank you. Thanks very much. Colin. That you, if you've if you've recorded the, the your sound locally, I suspect, and um, Crystal will confirm or otherwise, I suspect that will actually make Crystal's job a lot easier. Yes, it will. Mm -hmm. Oh, and I wanted to add something about Peter's presentation in November. He's going to show us the easy way to do thirty-two to sixty-four bit conversion. I mean, you can do things the tough way, or you can do things the easy way. Yeah, I think it'll be very interesting. I really enjoyed your presentation. Excellent. And yeah, just really everything was very good. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very kind.